Space, the final frontier. This is the Observer's Notebook, the official podcast of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. Its mission to explore the solar system, to seek out new observations and data, to boldly go where no podcast has gone before. And now the host of the Observer's Notebook, Tim Robertson. Hello and welcome to episode 165 of The Observer's Notebook, the official podcast of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. I'm Tim Robertson, the host of the podcast and also the coordinator of the training program within the ALPO. Thank you for downloading and listening. The Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers collects and analyzes observations of various solar system bodies and associated phenomena, and publishes detailed reports concerning these bodies in its quarterly publication, The Journal of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. This podcast depends upon donations from you, our listeners, to keep it going. If you enjoy what you hear in the podcast, you can donate to it via Patreon by starting at $1 a month. If you feel even more generous for $5, you get early access to the podcast before it goes public. For a monthly donation of $10, you receive a copy of the Novice Observer's Handbook. And for $35 a month, you receive producer credits on the podcast. You can help us out by going to www.patreon.com slash Observer's Notebook. And to join the ALPL, membership begins at only $22 a year. For more information, find out, find out more at www.alpo-astronomy.org. And you can also find us on Facebook. Just search for ALPO Astronomy. And this podcast also has a Facebook page as well. Just for, for, search for Observer's Notebook. And if you enjoy what you're hearing in the podcast, please, please subscribe. That way you'll no, never miss another episode. And now, we're continuing our series of Historic Observatories. All right, I'd like to welcome everybody back to this edition of the Observer's Notebook podcast. This is episode 165, and we're continuing our series on historic observatories. And today we're going to find a little bit about the Lick Observatory. And with me today is Paul Lynham. Welcome to the podcast, Paul. Thanks very much for the invitation. Yeah. Now, before we get into talking about the observatory, why don't we talk about yourself? You know, where are you from? How did you get involved with the observatory? That type of thing. Oh, okay. So uh, I'm probably like many of your listeners, uh, originally an amateur astronomer. I was very lucky in my youth, uh, somewhere between the age of six and seven, to have seen a bright green fireball go across the sky mm. in the evening at my home. And uh, so bright, in fact, even in an evening twilight sky in the summer, it cast shadows of the trees on the garden and they swung across the sky. So uh, wow. this is memorable for two reasons. One is, you know, this spectacular fraction of a second event that was dropping <laughs> green sparks and so on. The other reason I remembered it is because it's one of the few times in my youth that I can remember being with my brother and not fighting. <laughs> so my brother took a sharp intake of breath when he happened to see this with me. And he said, did you see that? And I went, yeah. And he said, that was a comet. And for some reason, I don't know how, but uh, I just didn't think it was a comet. Mm -hmm. I was aged between six and seven. And that's when we started fighting. And uh, <laughs> I went to my elementary school library and got a book about astronomy to try and prove my brother wrong mm -hmm. and uh, fell in love with the beautiful pictures um, with the galaxies, nebulae and that kind of thing. And uh, I wanted to see those things with my own eyes. And to do that, I needed to get access to telescopes. And uh, many of the pictures I saw in that book originated from Lick Observatory. Uh, do you remember what book that was? You know, I don't. It was one of these kind of uh, observers handbooks like the in, in the UK and Europe, they have the Collins Guide or the okay. Phillips Guide. So you had, you know, a section at the back with the stick diagrams of the constellations and then a short description in the accompanying pages of what objects were of interest in those constellations. OK. All right. So, so he sorted with this, uh, you know, uh, idea of wanting to look through telescopes i was very lucky because i was able to be put in contact with uh, the local amateur astronomical society at the time who welcomed new blood and fostered some my own interest and and had me doing little talks about night sky events and so on went through my school career and it was very clear to me what i wanted to do so i was very lucky in the sense that i didn't wonder in my late teens where i was going mm -hmm. I was always wanting to do things. So um, in Europe, this you started to specialize early in your career. So I was naturally 
you know, uh, selecting subjects, the, the scientific subjects, the mathematics and chemistry and physics and so on, with the idea of going away to university to study an undergraduate degree, which involved astronomy, which I was lucky and did. And then, uh, look again, luckily, I was able to get a sufficient uh, grade in my undergraduate degree to qualify me for PhDs, but I was kind of funded PhDs. But I was uh, hesitant, so I waited for the result, which came out quite late. So I did not apply ah. in due time. So I only started applying for PhDs after I knew my result. But that opened an opportunity to me because it gave me a chance to uh, get us. I was offered a scholarship for a master's degree in the meantime. Oh, my goodness. And that was working um, with uh, space systems and space platforms and looking at the effect of uh, meteoroids on orbiting spacecraft and trying to predict what would happen around with the Leonid meteor storm or the predicted then predicted Leonid meteor storm that was due around the turn of the millennium, around 1999, 2000. And some of that work went into consulting with spacecraft operators and so on um, to, you know, tell them, you know, they really should be wary of this thing. So mm -hmm. you know, NASA didn't fly the space shuttle and they feathered the solar panels of the HST, the Hubble Space Telescope, as a result of that. And a lot of the commercial operators like British Aerospace and the European Space Agency um, also took action on the recommendations of that report. Oh, wow. And uh, while I was there, there were other things happening. Some of my colleagues, I happened to be in the room when they were developing the uh, Philae lander or some of the instrumentation for the Philae lander that sometime later landed on um, P67, the, right. the comet there, um, the Rosetta right. um, space space mission, Rosetta Philae. And also uh, some of my colleagues there were working on preparations for the Cassini lander on Titan. Wow. So it was really nice to be, you know, working in an environment where all that kind of exciting stuff was going on. And, you know, these were long term projects. You know, they were going to be put on uh, on trickle charges on spacecraft to travel to the destination for seven years before they actually became active. So so, so these were like you're working at the university on these projects. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this was uh, it was called the unit for space science at the university I was at in okay. Canterbury in Kent at the time. It was like a. A subdivision of the then physics department. Okay. Um, and even though it was a fantastic experience in retrospect, it wasn't really, if I admit, and even though I loved as an amateur astronomer, you know, going out and doing the meteor watches and mm -hmm. um lying in a field and attracting mm -hmm. the attention of the police for <laughs> good reason, um, then I I I enjoyed that, but my the the small particles in the solar system was not my passion. As I said, I wanted to use a telescope to look at galaxies and nebulae. Okay. So this this uh, master's degree opportunity gave me the chance to kind of bide my time for a year and apply early for the next round, and uh, I was able to be a bit more selective in what I wanted to do, and that led me to a university in Liverpool, where I then was able to uh, start the PhD for a four year period, looking at uh, galaxies and a worldwide observational program looking at galaxies and uh, cosmic structure and the mm -hmm. way these galaxies are they're called cosmic flows get drawn across the universe wow so what brought you to lick so well even from the age of six and seven in that in that book like i said you know i i knew of lick um even in europe um so i finished my phd and I, Part of the PhD, I was working with some colleagues in Germany who had uh, access or had built um, the then most uh, useful all-sky X-ray satellite survey. It turns out that uh, clusters of galaxies, which is what I was studying at the time, um, can be difficult to identify just by line of sight projections on the sky because you know you, you don't know if they're physically bound together by gravity unless you do some follow-up measurements with. Mm -hmm spectroscopy and so on, or if they're just line of sight projection effects. So one of the nice uh, techniques that emerged to identify bona fide clusters of galaxies is that they sit in a diffuse glowing envelope of hot gas that shines in x-rays. So by having access to a, an all-sky survey from the x-ray satellite ROSAT, we were able to filter out some chance uh, alignments and uh, better identify bona fide galaxy clusters to do our search. So 
by working with those guys, I was invited to go and work in Germany, just outside Munich for a few years mm. um, to continue that research and expand it. And then right next door um, was the headquarters of the European Club of Nations at the time, which maintain a series of, of observatories down in the Southern Hemisphere. So at the end of my contract um, at the Max Planck Institute, I was invited to move to the this organization. It's called the European Southern Observatory or ESO. Um, I was there for a few years administrating some uh, 14 separate all sky surveys using oh my goodness. archival data from the um, the various telescopes that ESO operate down in the Southern Hemisphere. And then I was lucky enough to be offered my dream job, which was I was, <laughs> they didn't have to ask me twice, but I was <laughs> up to go down to Chile to live and work uh. in Chile and regularly commuting to the Andes Mountains um, from living in Santiago and uh, doing shifts at the most advanced technological observatory of the world right then, which was the Paranal Observatory on top of the Andes. So I did that for a few years. I was there for you know six and a half years. And then um, obviously, as your life moves on, you, your priorities change a little bit, fell in mm -hmm. love. And um, my wife was not really, uh, or my then fiance was not really enamored with the idea of living in Chile. She's not British, English is not her first language, neither is Spanish. And it just so happened that uh, at that time, there was an opportunity here at Lick. And uh, again, they weren't going to ask me twice. <laughs> right, right, right. Because the impression of, wow, you've lived your dream jobs. It seems like it, you're, you're doing what you wanted to do as a kid, uh, your passion. Yeah. And now you're a staff astronomer at Lick. Is that your title? or? That's right. Yeah, staff astronomer. And uh, it's, yeah, I've been very lucky throughout. You know, I've met some very nice people. People have taken me under the wing and given mm -hmm. me opportunities. So I've been very lucky. That's very cool. That's very cool. Now let's talk about uh, the observatory itself. Um, where it's located for those people that don't know. Oh, well, uh, Lick Observatory is known located in, I'm not sure whether, whether the San Francisco Bay is officially Northern California or Central California, but we're located just at the Southern end of San Francisco Bay. Uh, we're about maybe by straight line distance, 13 miles from the city of San Jose to the East okay. in the hills there. Uh, the winding mountain road it take, takes a bit longer. So it's probably about a 20, 21 mile drive from San Jose up the mountain. Okay. Yeah. I'm in Southern California. We call that Northern California. Where are you at? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no cow. Yeah. Okay. Well, so it's a, it's a, it's, it's got quite the history that observatory does. I mean, I'd be 1888 is when it was founded. What, yeah. What, can you give some like a overview of the brief history of, uh, of Lick? Sure. Well, probably like me, uh, many of your listeners uh, know the name of Lick Observatory, but mm -hmm. they probably don't know the whole story or even who James Lick was. <laughs> so James Lick was a um, Pennsylvania native. He was born in what a very conservative area in 1796 in uh, the town of Fredericksburg, Pennsylvania, which is only about five miles away from Hershey, Pennsylvania. So it's like a very sweet story. Um, Hershey came later, obviously. Mm -hmm. James Lick grew up. Uh, he was one of seven children. He was apprenticed to his father in this very small town. There was only about five, uh, 25 dwelling houses there. And he grew up learning the skills that his father had, making cabinets and carpentry and so on. And he fell in love with a local girl. And he went to ask Barbara's father to marry her. And mm -hmm. Barbara's father happened to be the local miller, who was a powerful man in the early 1800s because he was making everybody's daily bread. And uh, Barbara's father turned out to be a bit condescending and said, um, if you only when you have a mill as large and as, and as costly as mine, can you have my daughter's hand in marriage? And we see our first insight into James Lick's character because he didn't like being condescended to. And he made the miller a promise. Someday I will have a mill that will make yours look like a pigsty. And he left town <laughs> um, with one dollar in his pocket, as the story goes. And he uh, he was in his late teens, early 20s at this time. And he he he. Traveled through a few places, including Baltimore, um, and uh, he wound up shortly in New York City. And he was making the cases for pianos. Now, in that era, in the early 1800s, you know, we didn't have German luxury automobiles as the status symbol. So, to have a piano in your withdrawing room was uh, somewhat of a, a coup. Mm -hmm. And James noticed that the piano cases he was making were not staying in New York City, but they were being bought up in large lots and then loaded on ships in the harbor and exported to what was then the emerging Paris of the South, which is Buenos Aires in current day Argentina. Hmm. So he had this business acumen. Um, he negotiated with the captain of a ship to fit a 
piano in the captain's cabin in return for free passage to South America. And he eventually settled for a short time in uh, Buenos Aires and again prospered making the piano cases, filling the homes of the wealthy mm -hmm. with these uh, uh, status symbols. Didn't stay very long. Um, the situation was a bit unstable when he had many adventures, but he was prospering all the time. He took a holiday to Europe um, by ship and explored um, his heritage because his family were originally Dutch um, a long time before. So he, he visited London in the UK. He visited the Palace of Versailles in France and the low countries of the Netherlands on what would be termed the Grand Tour or a partial Grand Tour of Europe. But he didn't stay very long. He he was only in Europe for a couple of weeks, or well, a few weeks, before returning to South America. En route, his ship was taken as a prisoner of war and hauled into the port of Montevideo. And he was oh. and his the fellow passengers were also prisoners of war because Portugal and Spain were fighting over southern territories. Eventually, he got back to Buenos Aires um, and decided he was then going to round Cape Horn um, to relocate his business. To initially, the destination was Valparaiso in Chile. Um, there's a great story about the ship going around the horn and the the masts of the tall sailing ship touching the water as he went round. Oh my god! In the storm, um, he didn't stay long in Valparaiso before relocating to Lima, Peru, and again continues to prosper. And he was there for 11 years, just before 1847, 1848, and he was watching the war between the United States with Mexico. And uh, he was a very prominent member of the business community in Lima, and he made some important friends. Um, one was a confectioner, for example, named Domingo. But eventually he uh, decided he was going to relocate to what was then the town of Yerba Buena in 1848, in January of 1848, the ship that he boarded sailed in through the Golden Gate. And at the customs house, he declared three items. One was um, 30000 uh, dollars worth of Peruvian gold doubloons. That was the liquidated value of his piano making business. And the second was the workbench and tools that he used to make the pianos. And the third thing was uh, 600 pounds of chocolate from Guatemala that he had acquired <laughs> from his neighbor Domingo. And then he went into this town of less than a thousand people and bought up an adobe structure at the time. And uh, something happened less than two weeks after James Lick arrived in Yerba Buena. Um, which was that gold was discovered at Coloma at Sutter's Mill, spot the gold rush. And the only man in town in the town of Yerba Buena that had any ready cash to buy your lot as you suddenly started to rush to go prospecting in the hills was James Lick. Uh. So in the space of about 18 months, he became the richest man in California buying and trading these oh lots. Oh, my goodness. But, uh, I didn't know this. You know, and the town of Yerba Buena is today known as San Francisco. And James Lick owned most of it. In fact, a lot of it was actually underwater when he bought the lots. They were called sand lots, and people thought he was a bit mad. But we now know, you know, modern day San Francisco, a lot of it is actually ground refill or reclaimed settlements mm -hmm. on those areas that James Lick formerly owned. And he also, as a corollary to the story, he wrote back to Lima, Peru, and said to his friend Domenico or Domingo, um, why don't you come to California? Those 600 pounds of chocolate sold very well. And that's how Girardelli arrived in San Francisco. No way. Oh, it was the recommendation God. invitation of James Lick. And James Lick even gave him the first lot to start his business on. That's that's an amazing story. Yep. You yeah. got Girardelli <laughs> chocolate all over this house. I love that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Wow. Now, the first observatory went in. Uh, what telescope was that? Was that the, was that the refractor? Yeah, so so James, like you said, you know, he he lived a, almost a double life. He had a lot of years in South America, and then in like, from his fifties onwards, he was a property developer and pioneer in uh, what was then called the Valley of the Heart's Delight. Actually, it wasn't called Silicon Valley because it was a very fertile valley, uh, the Santa Clara Valley, for growing all sorts of different uh, uh, cash crops. And James imported exotic species and so on, including their native soil, to experiment with developing the prune industry and apricots and so on. Um, so he had lots of vineyards, lands and estates and orchards. And eventually, you know, he, he suffered a stroke in his late 70s and then started to consider the disposal of his wealth. And he had various ideas um, and he had been moving in society in San Francisco um, he was a member of the Masons, for example. He was also a member of what was called and still persists today, the Society of California Pioneers. And he was a benefactor of the California Academy of Science as well. So he, he had an interest in science. And, uh, and it was only really in later life. But at some point, 
he encountered a traveling itinerant astronomer who had been basically carrying a portable telescope around gold country and giving evening lectures. Mm. And uh, this, this man was the name of George Madeira and Madeira actually founded the first astronomical observatory in California in the town of Volcano. Um, but at some point in the interview, James Lick was fascinated by Madeira's uh, subjects, invited him back to the homestead and, um, and Madeira said, well, if I had your wealth, Mr. Lick, I would build a telescope on top of a mountain. And Madeira knew that observations conducted at altitude away from cities were far superior in terms of data quality than anything conducted at sea level or in an urban setting. And Madeira had realized this himself from his own experience, but this was something that went back to Isaac Newton in the 1600s. Isaac Newton wrote about this in, in one of his books, either uh, – Principia or opt, I think it was optics actually. Um, so that planted a seed in James's mind, the wealthy man's mind. But it wasn't the first thing he considered when he was actually ailing. Um, so the first thing he considered was to build three statues at the entrance of the Golden Gate: one of his mother, one of his father, and one of himself. And these were going to be fifty feet high. Oh my god! And uh, you know, his advisors said, "Well, maybe that's not the best thing because the first <laughs> things to be used for range finding in the event of a naval war would be mm. the heads of these statues." Then he decided he was going to build a pyramid, the, the largest pyramid in the world, that was to be his mausoleum um, in downtown central San Francisco. Um, and he had a million dollars. He assigned a million dollars of 1870s money to do this. Um, and he owned San Francisco. So this was going to be no obstacle at all to him. And again, people said, well, you know, the Mexican pyramids, you know, and the, the Egyptian pyramids, they've all been done. You know, what, what's new? And then eventually it came back to the idea of placing a telescope, building the world's most powerful telescope. Mm -hmm. And initially, James uh, wanted it to be in downtown San Francisco with his name over the door where people could see his greatness and benefit from his, mm -hmm. uh, his, his largesse. And finally, it evolved into, right, we'll put it at altitude. We'll put it at a high site. Because up until this time, every major observatory in the world was at, you know, a, a, a high population center, an urban setting, or more typically in a harbor because the astronomers were the keepers of time. They were firing cannons and dropping time balls so that the ships in the harbour could set their uh, mm -hmm. uh, marine chronometers to go to keep the longitude and go navigating around the world. It was like how empires were built. So the idea of actually placing an observatory purposefully at, you know, on a high elevation site away from light pollution above some of the atmosphere was a really big change in the thinking. So James eventually designated through through a few uh, uh, self-recriminations and so on, he evolved the project and he left money in his will to a trust um, some $700,000 at the time to set about building an observatory at high elevation in California on a location familiar to him. And James passed away at the age of 80. He did well in uh, October of 1876. And that's when the project to spend the money and liquidate the assets went into effect. So he signed the document in 1875. He passed away in 1876. And it took them just over 11 years to build the observatory to a complete state. And um, the first light of the observatory, at night at least, was done uh, was performed in January of 1888. And in June of that year, it was handed over whole and complete to the University of California. And that was a 36-inch lick refractor. Yeah, so, yeah, they had several telescopes at that time. And when they were building it, they were in a bit of a quandary, actually. Um, the Board of Trustees traveled all over the world, um, consulting with the major observatories in Europe and in the United States that are pre-existing to try to determine what would be the best design, what would be the best technology to deploy, how best to spend the money. And they prevaricated because at this time we were approaching a change in technology from mm -hmm. lens type telescopes to reflecting telescopes. Mm -hmm. And certainly reflecting telescopes were available at that time. But the Board of Trustees eventually uh, boxed clever and uh, plumped for a refracting telescope, a lens type telescope. So they contracted to have the most powerful, the largest lens type telescope ever made up until that time. And that was the 36-inch telescope, and that was placed at the south end of the observatory's original main building. But in the north end of the building, they also installed a, a slightly smaller aperture telescope, another refractor, which was um, a sibling almost of 
the 36 inch. The 36 inch refractor took some time to be manufactured, but that was being manufactured and shaped by a company in the US called Alvin Clark and Sons. Mm-hmm. But what had happened is that the board of trustees were aware from Alvin Clark and Sons that they had a cast stop. Now, not cast stop is probably not quite the way to say, <laughs> but a second hand telescope available at the 12 and a half inches also a refractor that was installed in the north end of the dome. So we had, when the observatory opened, we had a 12 and a half inch Clark refractor and a 36 inch Clark refractor. Wow. That 12 and a half inch itself had a history because it was uh, the formerly the property of Henry Draper, who was a New York medical doctor who passed away in his youth. And his widow eventually funded the... Um, Harvard College Observatory Glass Universe Plate Archive Plate Project, which was a continuation of what Henry Draper was working on. So, even that twelve-inch telescope, twelve and a half-inch telescope, has its own heritage, even mm. prior to Lick Observatory. No, is that still up there? Uh, well, sometime in the nineteen seventies, that telescope was removed, and we built a one-meter reflector and placed okay. it in the enclosure. So. We still have the telescope in storage. That's at the headquarters of the uh, University of California Observatories. That's in on the campus of University of California, Santa Cruz right now. But we still have that 12 and a half inch telescope. Yes. Okay. Now, the University of California, the whole of them, they are, they're the ones that operate the observatories? Yeah. So Lick Observatory is a wholly owned observatory. As I said, it was handed over to the University of California in 1888. A lot Mm -hmm. of people seem to think that early in its life, it was a private observatory. It was never that. Mm. That was never the case. Um, James Lick, even before he passed away, had the intention of handing it over to the people of California and to be administered by the university. At the time, you know, the University of California was uh, about 20 years in advance of Leland Stanford founding Stanford University. So it was the the prominent educational institution in James Lick's time. So, um, yeah, and there's been a few a few evolutions over time. Initially, the directorship of Lick Observatory went hand in hand with the presidency of the University of California. So yeah. the president of the university used to live on Mount Hamilton and also hold the title of director of the observatory. Hmm. Nowadays, we um, it's not just Lick anymore. We are involved in several projects. Mm-hmm. Um, University of California is in partnership with the uh, California Institute of Technology, Caltech, as an equal partner, but the administrating partner for the twin 10-meter Keck telescopes on Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And uh, Lick, uh, sorry, U- UCO, the University of California Observatories, is also a partner, a, a significant partner in the hopefully forthcoming 30-meter telescope project. So that's uh, at least three observatories that the UC has uh, hands in, but Lick is the only only old, wholly owned one, and we are effectively the training observatory for all the UC institutions. So that includes, you know, people from San Diego, Los Angeles, Berkeley, uh, Modesto, and the other uh, campuses that make up a total of 10 now, I believe, um, within the University of California system. And in addition to the observatories, there are um, – uh, a few instrument manufacturing facilities. There's the um, Laboratory for Adaptive Optics, which is mm-hmm. also on the UCSC campus. Down in LA, there's the Infrared Laboratory. And we also serve um, nearby national labs like Lawrence Livermore Labs, for example. And there's a lot okay. of uh, technology exchange goes on there as well. Okay. So is it is, is it a... Uh... Private is it privately funded then the observatories? No, no, the, the funding is drawn from UC funding. So okay. every right. year, you know, some some budget gets sliced off from the office of the president of the University of California, and that gets sent to the um University of California observatories, and then the director of the UCO will um apportion, you know, funding to Lick to the infrared laboratory, to the TMT project, and to the Keck observatories. And uh, there are some savings, obviously, of scale um, because we share some facilities right. and we're hosted on the UCSC campus, for example. Okay. what what? There's a number of domes on the mountain. What are some of the major instruments that you guys have up there? Yeah, so sometimes when people ask me this, I often lose track. <laughs> <laughs> So we have 
depending how you wish to apportion them, we have uh, nine or 10 enclosures with more than that number of experiments going on. Okay. Um, so uh, we have, let's go in order of, of uh, aperture. So the largest telescope on the mountain um, and the second largest in the world when it opened in 1959 is the Shane telescope, which has a, a reflecting telescope of an aperture of 120 inches in diameter or three meters equivalently. Mm -hmm. And that's our now our workhorse instrument. Um, it's basically scheduled for every day or every night of the year. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe Christmas and New Year we might have off, or every clear night of the year. And um, that ha that's that has several um, focal stations and several different instrument platforms that we can put on it that can allow us to address almost any modern astronomical topics so we have imaging capabilities we have spectroscopic capabilities we have infrared capabilities and we have adaptive optic capabilities yeah. we have cassegrain instruments we up until recently we were using wide field cameras at prime and we also have a importantly a CUDA focal station as well wow. which is very stable and allows us to develop new technologies down there for the future <laughs> so that's called the shane telescope also okay. it's named after a former director who shepherded that that uh, telescope into construction in the wake of, or as a spin-off from the Palomar uh, Hale telescope from you know in the late 1940s right the way through to 1959. Mm -hmm. Then we have a more recent telescope in terms of aperture at least which is um, a, a 2.4 meter reflecting telescope and this is called the APF and this is uh, the automated planet finder and it's this, I run out of superlatives to describe it. It's the most efficient, largest, robotic, most sensitive, automated spectrograph in the world. <laughs> so you like it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just don't like the name, you know, with <laughs> ELTs and VLTs and APF. So I, I'd love them to have a more evocative yes. name. But, um, so this is dedicated to the search for exoplanets using mm -hmm. the um, radial velocity technique. So measuring the wobble. Of, of the parent star, the, right. the, the gravitational pull that a planet induces or purported planet may induce. So in, in order to do that, you need to monitor and revisit these star candidates many times over the orbital purported orbital period of a planet that may be going around them. So mm -hmm. if you were looking to detect Earth around a sun-like star, for example, you would at least need to monitor it for a year because that's the orbital period, just to detect one one cycle of wobble. Um, so, and scientific data is noisy. So really you want to observe for longer than a year mm -hmm. if you're targeting a planet such as that. Um, but so so the, the APF was installed basically with the idea of having a very sensitive instrument, very stable instrument that doesn't get into an intervention very often, and is stable over a long time baseline. And initially, I think the project was a 10-year project. We're in the middle of that 10-year period now. And I think like HST and um, uh, the, the Kepler satellite, or even hopefully James Webb, it may go longer than that because it's such a now it's such a successful instrument. We're already routinely discovering multiple exoplanet systems uh, around you know, stars beyond our own sun using that facility and almost robotically right so at the in the evening the telescope decides whether it's within weather constraints it opens automatically it has its own pre-assigned uh, target list and it just robotically goes through so maybe my job will be redundant in 20 years time with the prevalence of these kind of robotic observatories coming online yes then uh, we have something called the CAT, the Coude Auxiliary Telescope, which is a 24-inch telescope, which is um, a smaller telescope that feeds the instruments at the Coude station of the Shane telescope. So when a very stable Coude spectrograph, for example, is not being used at Shane, we can feed it with this Coude Auxiliary Telescope. And many of the first exoplanet discoveries were made through the 1990s with that facility. And um, so it's got its own place in history there. Um, and again, that can be used for technology development. We can deploy novel technologies in the basement of the chain in the Coude and feed it with this smaller telescope with less risk to loss of, expo of ex um, observing time. Mm 
you can almost simultaneously observe a regular kind of project with the Shane telescope. And meanwhile, you can have um, novel technology being explored down in the basement by feeding it with this auxiliary telescope that's just off the side of the building. Mm. Then we have the Nickel telescope named after a San Francisco seamstress who gave us the seed funding in the 70s, which is the telescope that replaced the Henry Draper telescope okay. in the north end of the building there. That's a one meter reflecting telescope, and that was that has exactly. Sorry about that. Um, we have the nickel telescope, which is a one meter reflecting telescope that was inserted into the main building as a result of a San Francisco seamstress and a nickel, who gave a seed funding to assemble some spare parts and replace the Henry Draper telescope, and it's quite nice in the sense that it's. Although it's only one meter, it's exactly the same optical arrangement as the larger three meter Shane telescope. So we can use that telescope to develop technologies, ah. test out systems. And if they're successful, it's like a half an hour truck ride for the camera to be moved across and put on the larger telescope. There's okay. no extra optics or conversions that have to happen. And the nickel was also used again in the 90s um, and 2000s to pioneer and test out the idea of remote observing. So now many of the observatories around the world, you know, you can operate them almost from a cell phone. You can sit in a cafe in Amsterdam and operate <laughs> a telescope in Chile from your phone. Um, well, a lot of the pioneering work that was done inside the American system in the California system was done with a nickel telescope. And the nickel is used almost every night as well by actually undergraduates sometimes working on supernova detection, for example. Then we have uh, the Crosley telescope, which is not really used. It's not been used since. It's about 2010, um, but the Crosley telescope is probably the most important historic telescope in on the mountain, probably even more important in my view than the 36-inch refractor. It predates the observatory itself. It was originally built in 1879 in London, um, and it was the first large-scale glass reflecting telescope. Uh, Andrew Ainsley Common um, was an amateur astronomer, and he had this manufactured um, this not uh, almost a one meter piece of glass manufactured in 1896 or 1879 sorry and um had some silver deposited on it and won the gold medal of the royal astronomical society at that time for taking a photograph for, of something in the night sky fainter than the human eye could see eventually by a very circuitous route it wound up at mount hamilton in 1895 and was deployed by some very famous astronomers james edward keeler and uh Heber Curtis among them, to uh, demonstrate the practical application of reflector telescopes um, in a professional observatory setting. It was the first time it was done. So basically every telescope on Earth or in space nowadays owes its heritage to the Crosley telescope because it was the first professional refracting, uh, reflecting telescope. The Crosley was last used in, 90, in 2010 or thereabouts because it was initially a pioneer of uh, rapid response observing. So there was a guy sleeping in his cot on the observing floor, waiting for a text message from the swift gamma ray burst satellite. And then he would jump out after he'd received his alert and then steer the telescope to the coordinates of the gamma ray burst, trying to chase down gamma ray burst after afterglows. Um, we've discussed a little bit about the 36 inch telescope. That's the next one in aperture sequence. Um, yeah, it's a it's like walking into a cathedral. Mm -hmm. The vintage engineering and the environment and the beautiful redwood walls. Um, the thirty six inch is basically unchanged um, since it first went into operation in eighteen eighty eight. Still works the same way. Still the original lens and so on. Mm. We use it now generally for uh, public outreach, training students. Um, distinguished visitors and uh, we have a series of summer events through the night so it is possible um, to you know observe with it and look through it and uh, have the same experience that those Victorian astronomers would have seen um, it's a privilege to be in there even mm -hmm. when you're not observing and you know even a greater privilege to actually observe with it then we have something called the Katzman automatic imaging telescope um, this is important it was kind of installed in the 1990s. It replaced a Boller and Chivens telescope, which has since been relocated to Kitt Peak. But the Katzman Automatic Telescope was a telescope that was bought off the shelf. And again, it's a pioneering telescope because it was one of these robotic telescopes. 
Um, it's about 30 inches across, and it's dedicated to imaging largely galaxy clusters, looking for supernovae, you know, detecting supernovae in the early phase of exposure, quite often now pre-maximum light. And it's been running for a long time. It's managed by um, my colleagues uh, out of UC Berkeley. Um, the, the foremost among them is Professor Alex Filipenko, who's a very prominent mm -hmm. and prolific astronomer. Um, and that telescope contributed in the 1990s that to those both of those two papers in 1998 that suggested that the, uh, the, the rate of expansion of the universe was accelerating and later those uh, efforts won the Nobel Prize. Um, then we have the Torkman telescope, which is a 22-inch refracting telescope, a reflecting telescope. That was briefly used for research in the 70s, but um, it dates back to the 1930s and 40s. It was the largest amateur-built telescope in the world at the time, mm. built by a gentleman called, called George Torkman. And uh, it... Its design is very similar to the Great Melbourne Telescope. If anybody's seen those pictures of this beautiful lattice work of a telescope tube, this open bent metal. Um, nowadays, we use it for training uh, uh, our students. They get a bit of a chance to actually pull a telescope around, a reflecting telescope around, and learn all about coordinates. And they also learn about beautiful optics mounted on rickety mount systems. Um, <laughs> So it's a really character-forming experience. Then we have a double astrograph, two uh, telescopes mounted on the same mount, paralleled, um, twenty inches, two lenses, twenty inches across. And this is going back to some vintage from the nineteen forties. Um, originally, this telescope uh, had two photographic plate uh, uh, detectors installed each of a different sensitivity. One was sensitive to blue light, one was sensitive to yellow light. And the idea was that this, it was funded by the Carnegie Endowment, and the Carnegie Astrograph would survey the whole of the northern sky, and then ten, 10 years later, it would do the same thing again, and then a decade later, do the same thing again. And by doing that, you accumulate a database of change. Um, so you can compare some of the images. It's like an early Rubin type, type survey telescope, if you will. And it discovered a lot of things. So it was able to monitor and discover the change of colors and the change of brightness of sources and de detect things like Novi. It was able to monitor, actually, one of the main science drivers was it was able to detect proper motions of the stars. And by doing so, map out, use the stars as test particles in the gravitational potential well of the Milky Way galaxy. And we actually learned that the Milky Way galaxy is not flat but it like two fried eggs put back to back but it's like a giant potato chip it's got a warp in it and uh the thought that the astrograph gave us that data um the astrograph also if you take those stellar data away and you simply are left with the background distribution of galaxies in these 1.5 million photographic plates you can then embark on a project that shane and vertonen did um to count the galaxies mm. <laughs> over some you know 15 year period 14 year period and you what they did in the 1940s and into the 1950s was they saw the emergence of cosmic structure the 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 walls filaments and voids and uh, that was our first glimpse of the large scale structure of the universe and that dates back to the 1940s um and for example the existence of superclusters of galaxies was first posited as a result of that and that piece of work has been described as the birth of statistical cosmology hmm. the Torfman also has some laurels because it because it was such a large survey and so well calibrated these photographic plates that were taken were calibrated or matched up with radio telescopes of the era and you probably know that radio astrometry radio positions is uh, f are far more accurate hmm. than than uh, optical positions on their own so the catalogues that were produced, the optical catalogues that were produced by the Torfman telescope were very useful for navigation. And it was the, Tor sorry, this is the, the, the Carnegie astrograph. The Carnegie astrograph catalogues were used by the Voyager teams <laughs> to navigate the two Voyager spacecraft on the grand tour of the solar system to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus mm -hmm. and Neptune during, you know, during our youths probably.
And then finally, in this list or in this inventory, we have a vacant presently dome called the Croker Dome or the Crocker Dome. Um, the Crocker family are part of the California Big Four or Big Five who were involved in building the Transcontinental Railroad in the 1860s. Um, so there was Stanford and Huntingdon and, and a few others, but a couple of them were the Crocker brothers. And they became friends of James Lick or friends of the observatory and were regular donors to the observatory, as was someone called Darius Ogden Mills, who was a financier, another famous California figure. Um, and there's been a dome, an enclosure on the site for various traveling and temporary projects and so on. And the Crocker Dome right now is vacant, but one of its more recent contributions is when they were trying to um, develop the Kepler satellite for the transit technique for mm -hmm. exoplanet detection. Repeatedly, the principal investigator of that program was not being quite rejected, but was applying to NASA to get the satellite to fly. And NASA would say, please, you know, complete this step, demonstrate this technology. So for a couple of summers in the 1980s or 90s, you know, the, the Kepler satellite team were up here in that dome using a camera called the Vulcan camera to demonstrate that they could detect the very faint, like one part in 10,000 um, dimming of the light um, it, as a planet went across its, it, the face of its parent star. And so we contributed to uh, the launch of Kepler in that sense. <laughs> so that's the that's some of our major infrastructure. And through the years, we've had, you know, instruments come and go yeah. and various really interesting and exciting projects come by. That's very good. Thank you for that. Really interesting. Uh, what What is your major um, project right now you're working on? Well, my role here is uh, largely uh, to make sure we deliver working telescopes and working ah. instruments to our client observers every night. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, if something goes wrong, we have a very dedicated staff, um, maybe some 30 people here on the mountain, technicians, uh, custodians, um, maintenance people. Um, but obviously, uh, the first law of engineering is that machines will break. <laughs> so you do need people on call to assist okay. with a fix. And even though the telescopes are of a certain vintage, um, the systems and the cameras, the instrumentation are much younger than the telescopes themselves. Right. And we continue to deploy and develop very novel, world-class, world-leading technologies. Mm -hmm. So even though the telescope the Shane telescope, for example, dates from first light in 1959. The software on board dates from like four hours ago because we were tweaking <laughs> something to, to you know, make Understand. us a bit more efficient. So the, the largest slice of my role here is to ensure that the instruments get delivered and we get the highest quality data in the most efficient manner for all of our client observers throughout the UC system and their collaborators throughout the world, actually. Okay. Um, that partly involves not only health checking the instruments and making optimizations and uh, developing, it involves training the astronomers to use those telescopes. Mm -hmm. So sometimes now it's uh, undergraduates, for example, on some telescopes, um, some faculty um, who are new to our systems and graduate students, a lot of graduate students, uh, a lot of the time they'll cut their teeth uh, developing their observing skills here at Lick Observatory, um, you know, they'll be learning not to point the telescope through the floor and things like <laughs> that. And uh, we allow them to kind of make those mistakes. And we believe that they become better astronomers for it. It turns out now that as time goes on and technology improves, there's more and more distance between the skills you need as an astronomer to, you know, not point the telescope through the floor and the data that you get. Nowadays, a lot of people are using space-based telescopes and the data just get downloaded with your morning cup of coffee. Right. And the opportunity to actually go observing and develop these skills of ma maximizing the shutter open time on the sources and uh, minimizing the slew time and being efficient. They, the opportunities to new astronomers coming through are reducing because these training observatories are reducing as well. Hmm. The other lamentable thing is that even though we're building massive new observatories in the form of you know james webb and uh, hopefully tmt and the, mm -hmm. the extremely large telescopes of the future the community of people that have to develop the skills to build the instrumentation and an understanding of what the next generation instrumentation will require and how to deliver it that's also a very limited and shrinking community 
It turns out that a lot of the uh, graduates that go through all of the universities, they have very little exposure to tinkering. So hmm. if you go to, if, if you are lucky enough to be awarded time on Keck, for example, it's very, very unlikely that the staff at Keck are going to let you know, a 25-year-old graduate student walk into the observing floor and put their arm inside the instrument and start tinkering or turning a nut or removing a screw. And that's a role that we fulfill here at Lick Observatory because the the graduates and the, the, the trainees can actually do that. They have the freedom to develop their own instruments, develop their own techniques and pioneer things. Um, so that's another thing that I assist with. And uh, that's very exciting to see mm-hmm. these new technologies come along and to work with these amazing minds um it's very humbling to to hmm. see the capabilities of the next generations that are coming through not just for astronomy but a lot of these people are going to go out into the world in various other careers in science and be scientifically literate and it is it's incredible to see how they are able to harness things and and how their mind works it's it's a humbling experience well, that's, that's the other thing to hear. that um, my role involves, um, along with two of my colleagues, is uh, public outreach. So we have these public events and so on, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, efforts such as this, just engaging with our constituency and trying to, at the moment, educate people about light pollution and the impact that has on observatories and uh, going to schools and local events and just trying to get people enthused about astronomy and uh hopefully a little bit about Lick and, and they get a realisation of what has happened in their neighbourhood over the over the century and a half almost that we've been here. And then finally, when I get the chance, I'll engage in my own research. So I'm, I've got a bias and I'm very interested in um, the, the large scale structure of the universe. And I still like looking through telescopes at galaxies <laughs> and nebulae. So uh, I, I'm looking at these, these cosmic flows and these X-ray selected galaxy clusters and so on. But um, by virtue of working and living at the observatory, I also get invited um, to become part of some research programs as well. So I've also been involved in monitoring the weather on Neptune and Uranus through adaptive optic systems. Mm-hmm. And it's always stimulating. There's always some variety, always something new to learn and, and become involved in. Wow, Paul, that's, that's that's fascinating. And you mentioned the outreach. The, one of the programs you have there is Cosmos. Yes. So Cosmos, I believe, is um, some engagement with uh, high school students and probably early career uh, undergraduate students. Okay. I I am not the contact person for that. My okay. colleague, Dr. Eleanor Gates, is the Cosmos, uh, manages a lot of the Cosmos programs. And it involves um, the students either visiting the observatory and spending an evening using typically the Nickel Telescope. Mm-hmm. Um, the the electronic direct imaging camera that we have on board that and sometimes also uh, doing some remote connection now it, even before covid and you know video conferencing we were using remote facilities for a long time and uh, we, we we deploy them a lot and not just for cosmos but for various other things we've done some public observing you know online during the co during the pandemic and so on where, that proved popular um, and we're trying to engage more with uh, um, education uh, institutions and outreach institutions in the San Francisco Bay Area. Like there's a famous one here called the Exploratorium. So we're hoping to be able to inaugurate some kind of re- remote observing room okay. maybe in the down at sea level. That's good. That's good. Now, what uh, your vis- you have a visitor center and that's open to the public now? It is. Yeah. So, um, yeah. We we were formally open from noon till from from noon till five p.m. Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. However, we got a double whammy. The first was COVID, obviously, where everything mm-hmm. shut down for a while. And then in the middle of COVID, we had a fire in August of 2020 that came right over the mountain and spiraled around us and destroyed a few pieces of infrastructure. Yeah. So it took a while for us to recover from that, and we're still in the process of recovering from that. Um, but because of this law, you know, uh, our, our staff that support the uh, visitor centre uh, dwindled a little bit. So right now, our visitor centre is open from uh, noon till five only on Saturdays and Sundays. Okay. But we certainly have designed to uh, return to <clears throat> the new normal, um, mm-hmm. hopefully as we accrue a wider section of staff. Fantastic. 
Well, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? No, I'd just like to say, you know, it's uh, wonderful to get the opportunity occasionally to reach out to our constituency. I myself, you know, as an amateur astronomer, as a mm-hmm. child. Um, so I I still have that passion and it's a mm-hmm. wonderful thing to do. And I really appreciate people's interest. I hope they enjoy your podcast. And I think you're performing a service for the astronomy community by doing this kind of stuff. And uh, we're always, when time permits, available to reach out and give a talk about the history and contributions of the observatory to amateur astronomy societies, for example, or special interest societies, historical societies. So um, if people are interested and they would like me to do perhaps more likely a Zoom uh, Mm -hmm. presentation or so on, um, over the next few months, they can reach out to me or my colleagues here at Lick Observatory. Okay, and I'll put all the contact information in the show notes too. Okay. Well, Paul, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast today. This is really fascinating. Okay. Well, thanks for your interest and uh, have a good day and good luck and clear skies to your uh, listeners. Well, that'll do it for this episode of the Observer's Notebook Podcast. Again, I want to thank from Lick Observatory, Paul Lineman, for coming on the podcast today. What a great guest. I really enjoyed chatting with him. We upload a new episode of the Observer's Notebook on the 1st and 15th of every month. You can subscribe to us on iTunes. If you do, please rate and review us. I'd really appreciate it. And you can also listen to us on Apple Radio, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Google Play, Stitcher, Amazon Echo, Spotify, I got the hiccups, and the podcast is also available on YouTube. You can help support the podcast by donating to Patreon for only $35 a month, where you can receive one year's membership to the podcast, one year's membership to the ALP and producer credits on the podcast. With that, I want to thank the producers of this podcast, Steve Seedentop and Michael Moyer, for their generous support. The link for Patreon, as well as the link for the Alpo, is in the show notes. If you'd like to get a hold of me with uh, suggestions for getting rid of hiccups, my email address is cometman at cometman.net or on Twitter at observers, notebook, observers NB pod. Until next time, I hope I'll be breathing fine. <laughs> and we'll hope you all have clear and steady skies. Thanks for listening.